traditional owners on the on the of the land on which we're meeting tonight, so to speak. Um, that being the Jaja Rung, the Tungarung, and the Wurundjeri. And I'd like to um, pay my respects to their elders, both past, present, and future. So with that, uh, tonight's session, um, if Steve Khan joins us, will be about the intelligence officer role in an IMT and the information that they can uh, gather and provide. And with Michelle, she's going to go through EMCOP, which is an online program available to people within CFA who register, but Michelle explained that. And the information that's available on EMCOP, which is a cross agency platform for intelligence sharing and other useful information. Um, so by way of um, background, Michelle, as well as being a BASO within District 2, um, is also a mapping officer, an intelligence officer, and a situation officer within IMTs um, as required. So with that, uh, Michelle, I'll hand over to you, and thank you all for coming on. Thanks, Buzz. It's a, it's a bit awkward uh, getting someone in to introduce me tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, EMCOP, and I'll just uh, get my presentation up for you. Uh, so is that working for everyone? Can you, Chris, can you see the slide? Yes, I can. Yeah, fabulous. All right. So intro to EMCOP. Uh, I've got the, the web address down there. So if you want to uh, jot that down and you can have a play with it after the session tonight. Um, so EMCOP, as Chris was saying, is a an interagency um, intelligence sharing um, website platform um, that we use uh, at incident levels, but it's also available to all members of uh, any emergency service around Victoria uh, and lots of other partner agencies that we work with. Um, uh, it's, it's a way of uh, sharing uh, information visually, so via the map that you can see on the front there, but also uh, lots of other information in the background, all of the documentation around um, uh, ICC document, like uh, SMEAX briefings, anything, any of the templates that you need uh, all sit in here. So I'll just quickly go through. Um, I will take you through uh, a demonstration of it, but I'll just take you through this first. So it's a collection of web-based tools that are, are accessible on the public internet using any device with a web browser. So you don't need to be on CFA network to use this like you might have had to do for some of the other um, tools that we have um, to look after incidents. So it does require a us username and password um, and is available to anyone with a le legitimate role in the emergency management sector. So firefighter is a legitimate role. Um, EMCOP works best on a desktop or laptop. Um, it does work on tablets but it has limited functionality. It's a bit harder to read. So uh, it is something that we can use in the LCFs, the local command facilities, uh, but you can also have a look at home. Um, and it, it's built in um, Amazon Web Services, AWS. So uh, it's, it's easy to be able to access from everywhere. So if you haven't seen EMCOP before, uh, you will need to register. Uh, so you, there's a link on the front page to register and I've just got an image there of uh, the little registration section. So you do need to say that you're in the emergency services fr um, from the Country Fire Authority and in the Loddon Mallee region. You do need to use your members.cfa.vic.gov.au email address. Um, it, it speeds up the verification process and your registration may be declined if we can't verify. Um, and if you use a Gmail address, uh, they may not accept that um, as a, a registration. So your member's email address does, um, it instantly proves that you are part of the CFA. Um, if you have trouble with that, give me a call. I'm happy to, to help you through um, getting onto your member's email address. And also, uh, if or if you need to use a different email address, help you through the process getting into um, uh, EMCOP, we'll just have to make some phone calls in the background. 
Uh, there's also two sites. There's a, an emergency use site and a training site, and you need to register for both of them. So uh, not like many other programs where you can just have one a single login, you do need to register twice. Our main components of EMCOP are there's a situation map, which is an overview of Victoria. It shows us the locations of incidents, uh, brigade boundaries, district, regional boundaries. Um, it's got weather overlays and lots of other things, vehicle tracking. Um, we'll go through all of that later. That's a good visual thing to, to look at. Um, there's the operations log, which is a, a, it's like a file sharing site. So there will be uh, different documents in there um, that aren't specific to the map. So you might have your um, IAP in there. Um, and it's a way that, say, uh, as a, a firefighter or a strike team leader, you can grab a hold of that document before you go out uh, on a strike team, long haul strike team. You might be able to get some information from here. Uh, I will say that it's not always kept up to date. Not everybody uses it fa uh, fantastically, but you'll you'll be able to see what's in there when I have when I bring it up shortly. Um, the desktop is really just a big link section. It should just be called links. It, uh, it, it funnels you through to all of the different things you might be able to see. There's you know, sections on weather, sections on um, aircraft, all the different um, things that you might want to find. Uh, there's also a library and so that's your policies, procedures, all of your forms, uh, so your SMEAX briefings, stuff that you might need to use, um, and then a help section as well. So that's it for the, um, the boring part <laughs> or the slideshow part. Are there any questions yet? No? All right, I'll keep going. So I'm just going to share my other screen now. All right. So hopefully that's come up on the screen for you. So this is, I've, I've now logged into EMCOP. Uh, I haven't gone through the login page straight away. Uh, there's nothing special about it. Um, but this is what you see when you first open up EMCOP. And this is our situation page. So uh, while I've got a bit of a blue wheel here, um, there we go. There are lots of different things you can see instantly just looking at um, the situation. So you can see uh, we've got some fires going on here. So there was a fire at Pakapunyal safe uh, today at 4.38 p.m. and it tells you when it was last updated. So we've got incidents that have been on the go today. Um, something down in Geelong, uh, it looks like they've had road rescue uh, vehicle into a structure. So the, a little bit of information, it's the same as what you would see um, in some of the incident management log stuff on the CFA intranet site or the Brigades Online site. Uh, it replicated in here, but obviously in a spatial sense. Uh, also on here, uh, you can see some SES incidents. So there's one here uh, near Gisborne, if it'll come up for me. No, nope, it's not liking that one. Zoom in a bit. Um, oh, so there we go. There was an animal incident in Layla. So they might have rescued a puppy out of a drain or something. Um, all right, the other thing we can see is these little dots here. These are burns, generally dot burns. Um, I'm fairly certain that CFA burns will be in here too. Oh, something's gone wrong here. Refresh the page, see if that works. Oh, there you go. So there's the login page. Sorry about this as it reloads. What oh, doesn't? Goodness, this is embarrassing. Ah, here we go. There we go. So what I was looking at was the, these little dots here. So these represent burn offs. So we've got a uh, traditional owner burn up at Dingy, um, under control too. Had uh, one down here, which was another colour under control one fuel reduction burn. Uh, you will see different symbols depending on uh, what level the burn is at at the time. 
so uh, there might be a flame and when you can see the little flame uh, that means that the burn off is underway it's it's a going going fuel reduction burn all right so uh, you can zoom in and out uh, just either by scrolling the the wheel on your mouse or with these buttons here zoom in out and you just click hold and drag to pan the map to where you want to go so I'll go into around that'll do that covers our area um so up here on the top right hand side we've got some of our tabs maps here just changes the background um, or the, the base layer of the map so big map cartographic uh, mapscape which is what you're used to in the spatial vision map books um, so this is a, an exact replica or almost exact replica of, of what you'll find in the um, spatial vision map books uh, you can also do that in grayscale uh, that's helpful if you want to do some drawings so I'll drawing up here um, I'll draw a shape I just want to there you go it just helps uh, make it a little easier to, to see when that's black and white I'll just delete that shape Oh, doesn't like me at all tonight. Yes, don't believe that. All right, sorry, back to maps. So uh, Mapscape, we've also got the Google Maps. So uh, Google Physical, Google Satellite. So the satellite image is really helpful um, when you're doing some planning work. There's also Melways, Google Streets. Um, so that's what you'd see normally on your Google Maps. Um, I'll come back up to Mapscape just because that's our um, that's our usual base map. Data. This is this has so much information in it, so I won't go through everything. But um, uh, if you do get the chance to jump onto EMCOP, it's a really good space to have a play in and find out all the things you can see. It's got data from lots of different agencies in here, um, so we can do boundaries, uh, emergency service. So we can do districts, regions, um, brigade response boundaries. That one's a bit busy, so I'll switch that one off. Um, FRV districts now, Parks Victoria, SES response boundaries. So you can work out, you know, what the SES coverage is in your area if you if you haven't got that already. Um, ICC footprints. So there's lots and lots of layers you can turn on here um, to work out different boundaries. I'll take that, I'll leave the districts on. Um, so there's also weather districts, so uh, things like North Central, Northern Country, if you're not quite sure where those boundaries go. Um, that's, that's those. Uh, river systems, so River catchments. Uh, this might be helpful this year. Uh, if we do see some flooding, uh, you'll be able to see what river districts you are for uh, the uh, flood warnings. Uh, observations, bushfire observations is is a good one. Now uh, I did notice that there's not actually a whole lot uh, in here. Oh, I don't want to draw anymore. I did find a small fire area out near Buchan, really tiny. Uh, so in the height of the fire season, there will be fire areas all over the map. Uh, but given they wipe the data about July each year, uh, there's not much in here. So the only one I can find is this little fire here. Uh, so th this is a good one to look at when you are uh, going on long haul strike team. Or even if you've got fires in your own area and you want updates on where the fire outlines are, the outlines in here are completed by a, a mapping officer in an ICC or the State Control Centre. And then they get published here on EMCOP. So you can come and have a look at them. And they are live. So um, if I'm sitting in the mapping office chair editing, as soon as I finished editing, it will be available to see here in EMCOP as well. Um, Michelle? Yeah, Chris. Chris just had a uh, comment pop up, and it's um, 
you may have mentioned it already, but just to repeat though, if you want to get on and play and find out what's in it, make sure you play in the training space, not Absolutely. in the live data. Because if you put a map in in the live data, people will think there's a fire there. Yeah. So look, the, the beauty is in EM Cop, you can't input that data. You can draw and only you see your drawings. Um, the maps are done through EMAP, which is a separate system run by DELP. So thankfully you won't be able to draw a fire outline in this, but still um, I think the issues come for people doing warnings and advice because they come through our EM COP to do those as well. Uh, and there have been cases of people um, putting out shark warnings in the middle of the forest. Uh, and then they obviously also get uploaded in to the emergency VIC app and um, or VIC emergency app and uh, uh, available to the public. So yes, use the training site uh, and you can know it's the training site by seeing this little red bar up the top. So this site is for training and exercising purposes only. It still shows all of the current information. Um, so it, it'll still give you everything you need to do, but it's not like you don't have to worry about clicking a wrong button anywhere and, um, and making anything public. All right, so yeah, there's your fire outline. Um, other information in here, there's predictive services. So that's uh, the Phoenix tool. So if you're looking for some of the fire predictions, um, I don't think there'll be anything uh, available at this point in time because we don't have any big fires going. Um, infrastructure, so there's, uh, you can find locations of things. Uh, locations of fire danger rating signs, snow poles, ambulance stations. I'll have to zoom out a bit to see any of this. But there's lots of information in there you can pick up. So there's, I can see these little triangles pop up in here. Um, oh, they're, sorry, they're the fire danger rating signs, little fire danger rating signs there. Um, again, it's something to, that come and have a play, see where things are. You know, helipads, airfields, lots of different information. Uh, there's some topography, so see what that's like. That's just giving us um, different uh, topographic information. You can also upload data. Um, it's probably a bit complex for here, um, but if you uh, do have a play and you're interested, I'm happy to take you through that. Uh, individually at a later time, just let me know. Um, another one, uh, so we've moved on to the next tab, tracking here. This is a good one. So here we go. I can We can have a look at where all of the CFA tankers have been uh, in the last 30 minutes. So we know what's on the move. Um, this is helpful when trying to work out where your tankers are. Um, as a mapping officer, I find this useful when I'm trying to work out where the flanks of the fire is or where the head of the fire is. Um, I can track the aircraft and where they're bombing and that's generally the head of the fire. And if I'm tracking the vehicles, I can generally find out where the flanks of the fire are. So just having a look at this, um, so tankers, CFA tankers in the last 30 minutes and it looks like Chewton. Um, we might have to zoom in a bit. Or Wallen, so someone started up the Wallen tanker. Um, and so that's that's around Tullarooks up and about um, St Andrews. So that just tells us what, what tankers, uh, maybe they're out for training, um, maybe they're out for a job. Uh, yeah, so there's our tankers. We can also get the trails of where they've been um, and that's again, we use that in an incident to find out um, it, if someone's involved uh, in an, a rollover, a burnover, anything like that, we can find out where they've gone, where they might be. Um, yeah, I'll turn those off again. Now, I'll just turn off some of these, Oops, oh, this data as well, because that's getting a bit much. Just another question, Michelle, while you're doing that. Yeah, um, go for it. From Brian Greenwood, do you need to be on a dispatch channel to be tracked? Yes, you do. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> you do need to be on the dispatch channel uh, to be tracked. So, 
uh, yeah, we, we do find that that does cause issues where we can't can't track vehicles once you're on the incident channel. Um, I don't know what they're doing about that at this point in time. Uh, if you would like to be tracked while you're on an incident channel, um, push that up through VFBV, um, places like that. Uh, we might be able to get some traction in being able to do that. Uh, Steve might be able to answer that a bit later on as well. Um, unless, is Steve on, Chris? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> I'll go to the plus 47. You continue and I'll let you know next sure. break. All right, no worries. So uh, I'm coming up to my favourite part uh, is the weather. Uh, so uh, I'm sure most of us had uh, storms come across last night. And some to, it's not so much of an issue now, but during fire season when everything's really busy, um, if we get some dry lightning come through, that's something we want to jump on top of really quickly. And we can do that by coming into our lightning tracker. So this is uh, different colours mean different times since that lightning strike. So pink up here is that's lightning that's happening now. So within the last 30 minutes, uh, it then is 60 minutes, which is the orange, then uh, or red, then orange, yellow, green, and then blue. So uh, we can see that at the moment, there's been some storms uh, up near Benalla. There's recently been some storms around Tarragon, so that's uh, up to two hours ago. And then all these blue ones are up to 48 hours ago. So what we got yesterday. Um, so by the looks of it, look, if you're around Castlemaine, Dalesford, down to Gisborne, uh, you may have experienced some lightning. I'll just zoom in a bit. So while it looks a bit vague when you really um, zoomed out, I'll just zoom in on these Castlemaine ones. And we can actually pinpoint not Exactly, there is some er uh, margin of error in here, but uh, you can find the, the area that you should be looking in to find these lightning strikes when they pop up for me. Oh, here we go. So we can see that we've had a lightning strike on, oh, it's really tiny to see, so I hope you can see this on yours. It's in here on Fords Road. So uh, we can see some smoke that's popped up, um, not quite sure of the best way to access it. It, it might, for instance, have been uh, in around the Castlemaine diggings. Um, you don't know whether or not you're looking on Morris track or you're looking on Jacob's track, but you can see the smoke. Um, you can come in, have a look at where those lightning strikes have come and, and it'll be able to direct you a bit more closer to where you need to look. Chris, is that you? No, Michelle, it's Steve Kahn. Ah, I'm Steve, sorry. Yay. I, I've had connection issues and all sorts of problems, so no, thanks I finally I've, fixed it. Excellent. Well, I'll finish off what I'm doing in here uh, and then we'll jump to you. Thanks, Steve. And please jump in at any point in time um, if you've got any comments. So just going, I was showing everyone the lightning tracker in EMCOP. Uh, we'll zoom out again. So look, there's also the latest rain radar. Looks like plenty of you have got rain at the moment uh, or you've got a big storm coming your way. So um, again, lots of information that you can use for different different things. Uh, there are the wind barbs and the wind bases for when you're trying to work out um, your rate of spreads or just want to know what the weather's like. So that's those. Uh, is there any questions about uh, the map function. No. All right, I'll move on to just, I'll quickly go through these other sections here. So the operational log uh, I was showing you about earlier. So we've got, um, there are some things in here. So. We don't always have everything in the uh, ops log, but there are certainly a few interesting bits and pieces. So I'll, I'll have a look at this predicted fire area from July. 
view file. So that's this may have been for a training exercise uh, and someone's done some predictive um, drawings around what a fire might have done. So uh, it's good to have a look. You won't always find what you need, but quite often there'll be um, some interesting things in the operational log. Desktop. So this is your bookmarks page, uh, bookmark page. Um, a bit like Pinterest if you like me and use that all the time. Um, so it's just links, lots and lots of links. You can come and watch the State Control Centre briefing. Um, you can uh, check out information about the regions, looking at the State Control Centre map pack. So this is just uh, overall operations. Um, there's also some information displays. Um, I always liked the Melbourne traffic one. You feel like you're in the traffic chopper. Um, there you go. So you can see, uh, obviously not everybody. Oh, oh, there you go. A few more have come up. So uh, Queens Road, um, City Link, uh, the Prince's Freeway, Doherty's Road, looking west. So a bit of traffic on the road, but not too much. So lots of different uh, traffic cameras. Um, power outage dash dashboard, um, weather information. So fire weather might be one. You might be able to have this up on, on the screen in the fire station on a total fire band day just to um, get a, an overview of what the weather's doing. All right, uh, weather, that's a bit more in depth about weather information, um, fuel based reports, uh, there's the weather briefing, uh, which you may have seen emailed out. Oh, this might not, you might not have issued one for a while. Let's see if this one works. Ah, oh, there we go. So they have, because we've got some storms happening and some rain. So this one you, you will have seen for uh, fire when we get them uh, into the reds and the oranges and yellows uh, on the days here for each of the fire districts. We also run these for um, flood events, storm events, anything where there's significant weather. Um, but if there's nothing significant happening, we don't, we don't always publish them. Uh, un unless that's changed, Steve. No, good. All right. Uh, they're, they're, pub they're published every week. A couple oh, of they times, are? Twice a, twice a week. Yep. Okay, all right. And, cool. and in fact, during the fire danger period, they're updated daily. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, warnings, uh, there shouldn't be anything in here that you need to touch, and this is uh, in the live site where you might um, uh, come, uh, you might click things, but otherwise, uh, it does tell us about fire restrictions. Have a play in the training site, don't have a play in the live site in the warning section. Um, so this is the other sections that you might find in an ICC. They've each got their own little uh, bunch of links. Um, so there's some intelligence tools, uh, lots about uh, aviation. So if you've ever wanted to download the aircraft fleet poster, uh, take it to uh, office works and get it printed up on your wall. There you go. You can download that from here. Um, one thing that I will show you uh, is AIG video uh, or AM live video here. So uh, this is what you will see from the AIG machine uh, when it's flying around a fire. So if you are in an incident control center, um, so you just use your FireWeb login and if you've got those. Uh, this is our eye in the sky. So at the moment there's nothing up and flying, but uh, when you do have an aircraft flying around your fire, um, you'll, you can come in here and find it. It is really, really um, data intensive though. So uh, don't have it running all day. Uh, it's, I think it was 3.2 gig of data per hour. So if you're on a on a internet plan, it will chew through it really, really quickly. Um, but it's a really useful tool to, ha to have at a local command facility or even just at the station um, to have a look at what's going on. Uh, it switches from between infrared images and video images. 
uh, we, we might have a session one day on uh, what you can see from the, the cameras here. So I'll take that away. Back to MCOP. Uh, look, lots of things. Again, just have a play with it. See what you can see. Uh, there's some training information. Uh, rosters, if you need to know who the RDOs are anywhere. Um, and that's probably it for what, what any of our general firefighters would need to see. And last one here, we've got the library. Um, what you would generally use would be in our IMT toolbox. And that's where you would have found all of your information previously, like um, your SMEAX briefings, incident control, logistics planning, safety uh, documents. So critical incident action plans, um, lots of different checklists, fact sheets, aid memoirs in here. So if you've got an interest in something in particular, uh, you can come and have a read. And then the help. Uh, and that's going to take me to a separate site. Um, but there you go, there's help help sections for lots of different areas. So that's it. Uh, has anyone got any questions about AMCOP at all? Or has anyone used it before and got some comments or feedback? Michelle, it's Pete. Yeah, um, Pete. Yeah, look, the best thing you can do is get in there and, and fiddle around, and see what's in each tab, look at what, when you uh, click on a, um, a button or something, and see what it does, and you can just look, and I can assure you it'll take ages to get through things, and you just forget unless you keep playing with it all the time. Spot on, Pete. And even, even I come across things I haven't seen, and I use it quite regularly, so... Um, yeah, if you if you can get yourself a log on uh, and have a play, uh, best thing to do. It's a great program, a great way to share information and to, to gather information about uh, the incidents that are happening at the time. Um, I'll just check if there's anything. No, nothing in the comments. So I might pass over to Steve Khan now. So Steve, you want to jump in? You're on mute, Steve. You'll have to unmute, Steve. You're there on mute. Go. That's that's you're on mute is the saying for 2020. Absolutely. Um, Apologise for being late. Um, I've had some connection issues and some issues with my computer today, uh, but. I think everything is now working. Um, if I can get control, uh, I'm not sure how I how I actually do that. Uh, oh, sorry, I was I was on mute then. Next to the leave button, there's a square with an up arrow, and that allows you to share your screen. Uh, right out. So I will. Uh, I'll just get this one down and that one down and that one down and that one down. I just thought I'd give people a short overview of what intelligence uh, um, is. A little bit of an intro to intelligence. Everyone can see that. Uh, not yet. Not give, yet. It, give it a sec. No, it hasn't, hasn't come through yet. Do you want to try that again, Steve? Okay. I'll get out of that. If you hit the share button, you uh, have to then pick the screen you want to share or and all the windows. So you, you might get prompted after that. Uh, thank you. No, whiteboard. So yeah, you're on. You're in the right part. So just choose the screen you want to share. And I can't see the the one that I want to share. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, hold on a second.
that's the one I want to share. So let's go back to oh, here. That's not the one I want to share. It's no. Coming, coming up with something now. No, that's not the one I want to share. <laughs> All right, so just uh, you can close off uh, or stop sharing the screen with the uh, square and the X in it. Uh, Might so be I'm in the video box. Technologically dyslexic. <laughs> that's all right well Steve uh, do you want to try and email it through to me and then um, I'll share it for you and uh, you can just talk to it how about that right out. I'll try that so oh stop presenting yep stop presenting so thanks for your patience <laughs> everybody as, as you can tell we're all sorry about that. I'm technologically <laughs> dyslexic Oh, uh, good. Hang on. How about uh, share content and no? So while Steve's looking for that, um, the intelligence role is one of the roles in the IMTs now. Uh, it's also performed at a regional level and a state level. It's about the gathering. Uh, I don't want to steal your thunder here, Steve, but the gathering, collection, processing and dissemination of information. Um, that's one of Steve's roles for an introduction to Steve. Um, Steve's also a uh, planning officer and a, a fire, an FBAN, what we call a fire behavioural analyst. Um, so last season he had a, a significant input into the FBAN and the intelligence activities in the larger fires in Victoria. And I don't think you mind me saying, Steve, that you've been providing an intelligence role to the state control centre for the agencies other than health in the intelligence role, is that correct? That's that's true. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, during COVID-19, I've been uh, uh, working as intelligence officer for the region and on part of the state pandemic management team as well. And I wish I could share what I've what's on the screen. <laughs> Uh, have you got two screens there, Steve? No, I've only got one. I'm I'm yeah, okay. working off a laptop, so uh, would, it, worked, would it worked the other day. I did a I did a session for uh, for um, act, um, commanders the other day, and uh, um, it worked all right. And, for some reason tonight, it's not working. Would there be anything in the IMT toolbox around the the function that could help us? If Michelle could uh, look, it? I, I can just talk to the talk to it if you want to. Yeah, just just chat to it. Okay, I'll just chat to it. So it's about. Uh, um, so what's intelligence? I was talking. Uh, just Chris is act, actually has stolen my thunder a little bit. It's about collecting and analysing information and disseminating analysed information. And the the essence of intelligence is about supporting decision making and planning. So it's about having clear direction about what sort of intelligence we need to get, what we have to collect, analysing, processing that intelligence and then putting into a product that actually people can use that becomes useful. And, and if you think about things, a fire prediction, prediction of spread, prediction of flame height, predi prediction of fire intensity, um, area that's going to in, be impacted by a fire, that's actually a process of intelligence. So it's about collecting different pieces of data and then turning that data into something that's actually going to be useful to assist decision making. Some of the things that we uh, that we do in intelligence. So it's about uh, processing information into things that are that are actually relevant to what's going on. It's accurate. 
it's timely. It's no point in getting intelligence or putting out products that uh, that by the time that you go through the cycle and you get them out, that they're uh, that they're no longer valid or functional. And really, it's about establishing that common operating picture for everybody at the incident. Whenever, whenever we go to an incident, we actually tend to see a small part of it. So, what intelligence does is help those that are at that are at the incident and running the incident actually try and look at the bigger picture. And some of the things that that intelligence does in establishing that common operating picture is it supports people who have got to make critical decisions. It supports that that forward planning for the incident. And it actually helps us look at what's the consequences. So it relies upon critical thinking in where are we now? Where are we going to be? And what's the actual incident going to look like in the end? Who's going to be affected? How? And it then, if you like, opens up the window of, of, of those people that need to make decisions, of being able to go, well, you know what? Um, the incident, yes, the combat side of things, we'll look after that, and we do that really, really well. It's the, the consequences and the ongoing uh, implications that incidents have that tend to really catch us out. And one of the things that intelligence does is help us to, to actually get a handle on what those consequences might be. Um, good, um, uh, Michelle, you'll like this one. Uh, during the uh, the COVID nineteen, one of the one of the things that um, we had to turn our attention to was how do we get how do we actually get enough bees into Victoria to dis to ensure that the almond harvest in the north of the state can actually go ahead successfully or sorry the uh, the pollination of the almond trees in the north and north of the state can go ahead successfully so that the industry isn't um isn't devastated by the COVID 19 pandemic so that was a that was a an issue particular to the northwest that we actually had to kick up to the state that then went to the uh to the, um, the cross-border decision-making body of the federal and state governments to decide how what's a way that we can actually get um, enough bees and beehives into the north of the state without people having to quarantine so that, that uh, the pollination of uh, the almond trees could go ahead. There you go. That's just one sort sort of thing that uh, intelligence actually looks at. So the real questions around intelligence are about what's happened, what's happening now, what's likely to happen. So what? And that's a big question for uh, for intelligence. Things occur. Uh, so intelligence as a function asks that question, so what? What does that mean? And then we very much are concerned about looking at what is the consequence? What are the consequent what are the consequences of the emergency? And you know we look at various things, the built environment, the uh, um, the consequences of people, infrastructure, uh, the economic consequences, the social consequences moving forward. So um, the scope of in intelligence is, is actually, it started out about things like uh, around 
predictions of uh, of flood levels and predictions of fire spread and um, things that were very centered on the here and now and the immediate future about the uh, about the actual incident and very very soon it moved to looking at what are the other consequences um, i had an interesting interesting case when i was at, at the uh oh, what about two years ago when i was at the uh, uh scc and we had a uh, we had a cruise liner that left melbourne and then became disabled just off uh, western port um had something like 1200 passengers uh the issue with the cruise liner was that um it was uh it was probably going to have to go into western port uh what were we going to do with the 1200 people they couldn't stay on board um the issue with the other issue with them is that uh, is that they were they had actually left Australia, so they had to be put through immigration, uh, coming back in. They were going to be taken off. They needed to be taken off the cruise ships in or the cruise ship in uh, life raft life rafts if they were going to be evacuated. Uh, if they're going to be evacuated in life rafts, they can't take any personal possessions with them. So, uh, essentially, uh, no no telephones, no passports, no other documentation, no clothing, uh, and they were going to be taken off the ship into um, somewhere in Western Port. Now, nowhere down there had facilities that could actually uh, cope with that many people in a short space of time so part of the intelligence role in in that instance was to uh, was to actually work out or try and work out with uh, other government authorities federal government authorities uh, how we were going to accept these people process them and uh, uh, look after their welfare going forward so uh, it's been a intelligence has been a very interesting ride. I've I've got to get got to deal with some uh, very interesting uh, and diverse range of uh, circumstances, emergencies, uh, not all class one emergencies and not all class two emergencies. So uh, there's a lot of good information out there, but the thing that actually makes intelligence tick is the people on the ground and you as incident controllers firefighters people that can actually provide good situational awareness is really really important to the ongoing intelligence function and i reiterate uh, and i'm sure that chris will back me up that for those people in the background we're we're remote from what's going on we rely on you to paint that picture for us to give us uh good situational reports or good situation reports and good information that allows those of us that are sitting back to make good decisions if we don't have good information we're working on um, in some would say a wild ass best guess, but but in order for us to make good decisions, we need that really good input from you people that are on the ground. Good information in terms of fire, information, rate of spread, flame height, spotting, local weather conditions, assets at risk, likelihood of control um, things that are to our advantage things that are to our disadvantage with all that information we can then make better decisions that will support 
you people that are out there on the fire ground doing the hard stuff. Um, so probably on that note, I'll shut up for a while now and uh, happy to take any questions. Cheers. So has anyone got any questions? I'll pop them in the chat or, or stick your hand up or speak up. Michelle, I'm Steve. Um, just a question, a question, Steve. If you're out on the fire ground, say as a strike team leader, and you put in information for uh, the intelligence section, how does the information get to you? Okay, so so if you're providing information um, via a, a situation report back through the chain, so intelligence sits very much um, next door to operations. Uh, we tick tack very closely with what's happening in the in the radio uh, world, I suppose, and that's probably the the major way that we get information back yeah for me it's definitely via radio uh yep. so I, i'm i would generally work at an incident level um as situation officer um which does some of what the intel officer does um, but at a, at a local level um so we try to have uh, a radio listening set or, or running the app in the background um, or have someone who sits in the radio room and with operations uh, to try and find that information. Um, and sometimes we'll uh, even be in contact, direct contact with the incident controller. Uh, another source of information for us is through the ground observers. Uh, and I know that's probably going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, still waiting to see what the outcome is about FRV uh, filling those roles. Um, but definitely the ground observers are our eyes and ears on the fire ground and they feed information back into um, the planning and situation officer or the intel officer, depending on uh, what function is being um, activated at an ICC. The, uh, the other thing is uh, that you actually might, you might get a uh, direct call from intel to go, I need some specific information and that occurs every now and then as well. Uh, and I've just, uh, it's just popped up. Don't forget about the air observers and air attack supervisors. Absolutely. Um, we do get information from them as well. Um, uh, we can get that via some of the electronic platforms. Um, so our air observers um, and some of the air attack supervisors can uh, draw lines on maps using the fire mapper program, um, or they can contact us via radio as well. Uh, and that's that, instant information. That's true, but they, they tend to miss a few things because they're wearing those dark sunglasses all the time. <laughs> Looking too cool. Sorry, Chris, you've got your hand up. I was just going to add to, it's Chris Jacobson again, that uh, the information that the intelligence unit's chasing is is very similar to what the, the RDO or the district might be asking in the early stages of a fire. Um, for, the, for the same reasons, you know, will, will first attack succeed, will it not? if it's not going to what resources are likely to be needed and that early intelligence from the first vehicles arriving is critical to making sure the resourcing is correct or if there's competing requests for resources uh, where they're allocated so um, intelligence starts from the very first truck out the door possibly even seeing the uh, you know the pyrocumulus cloud developing above a fire you know so that that sort of information is critical um, and it'll transfer, obviously, from an RDO or district perspective up into the IMTs once they're established. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a question from Trevor Roach on the chat function. Um, will the intelligence section be implemented this year in Lodden Mallee's ICCs? And if so, have the ICC facilities been upgraded to enable the function to work effectively? And do we have sufficient trained people to support ICCs when required? Um, so, Trevor, I, I suppose when I'm sitting in the situation chair as a situation officer, um, I would probably sit in the same chair as an intel officer or an intel analyst um, doing very similar things. So uh, I'm trained, Steve's trained, we've got a few other people uh, in the region who are trained up. Um, 
but I don't think there's been the formal um, transition to have intelligence at an incident level. We certainly do have it at the RCC level. Uh, I'm super keen <laughs> to have it at incident level because um, I can see the benefit. Uh, and we do have other people who work in the intelligence function who don't need to be retrained. So they would be mapping officers, uh, the F bands, um, any of the weather specialists, um, uh, other people would be like cultural heritage people. Uh, so essentially we would be taking the planning function and the planning function uh, works on writing the IAP. So taking the information that the intelligence officers have to give and turning it into a plan to deal with the incident going forward. So uh, I suppose at an incident level and uh, Steve can comment, I suppose, from uh, from all, all levels, but regional and state level, is that as an intelligence officer, I will give you the information you need, but I won't be telling you what decision you need to make. Is that correct, Steve? Uh, that is correct, Michelle. Uh, the Unfortunately, the, the intelligence officer role at an ICC level uh, hasn't been uh, if you like, formally agreed between uh, between all the agencies. It's still a matter for the uh, incident controller to decide whether they need to establish an intelligence officer within their IMT. So the decision is, is still left with the incident controller. Yeah, and look, another thing, it, where, I, where I see it fitting is when you've got a going incident uh, and you don't want to stop that intelligence information coming in, being gathered, being analysed. Um, but from a situation of officer perspective is once we've got a going incident, the situation officer can get caught up writing the incident action plans and all of the intelligence gathering stops at that point. So that's when the incident controller might say, OK, we've had the situation officer previously. They were giving us weather information. They were giving us numbers of people in places, whatever it was uh, in readiness. But now we've got an incident. Now we've got to write a plan. But the resources that are writing the plan were the same resources gathering that intel. And you might need people to continue to gather that intel to keep the plans current. So that's that's my take on it anyway. Uh, any other questions? No, uh, Michael, did I see your hand up earlier? Yes, Michelle, but it was uh, answered in the previous questions. Yeah, good. All right, cool. Uh, well, before I finish up, I'm just going to share my screen again and uh, show you something pretty cool. Uh, so uh, is that showing up now? Can you see all the pretty colours? Yes, looks dangerous. <laughs> so, uh, look o over WA at the moment. We've got pink lightning, which is uh, which is the most current. So, in the last thirty minutes, that could probably cover the entire state of Victoria. Um, so that's uh, yeah, the, the current lightning tracker. There's a lot of activity in the air. Um, so. Yeah. All right. So that's that's it. And there you go. That's that's the, the background for me as well. All right. Um, well, if there are no further questions. Be happy if you stop it at the border. <laughs> if only I could, Eric. Um, all right. Well, we might wrap it up there. So thanks, everyone, for um, coming on board.